Travis family, he has risen. He has risen indeed. And life is worth the living because he lives. We want to welcome you today. If you are our guest, we want to thank you for coming to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with us together. Uh, we would love to introduce you to a small group, a Bible study that meets just after this, that you can be known and, and to know one another. And if you have a desire to do that, I would encourage you at the Welcome Center uh, to ask, and they'll be able to find a group for you that you can uh, dig further into the joy of the resurrection. In your pew, there is a Next Steps card. And if you're our guest, we would ask you that you could pull that out and fill out the info and the guest section of that. Or there is a QR code on the screen that you can, uh, if you prefer to fill that out electronically, we would be honored to know you and to uh, reach out to you and just thank you for coming and being our guest today. We have much to celebrate. And on this resurrection day, we celebrate the coming of life the spiritual life of one of our own in baptism. Let's celebrate together. Good morning. Meredith and I would like to present our daughter, Violet, who has accepted Jesus as her savior. She wants to share that decision with all of you all this morning through her baptism. Violet, have you accepted Jesus as your savior and decided to live with him your whole life? Yes. Then on your public profession of faith in, in Jesus Christ, and according to his command, I baptize, baptize you, my sister in the Lord, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life.
Amen. Well, Christ is Lord of all, and he has risen from the grave and is alive forevermore. Stand with me as we give him our worship this morning. Christ the Lord is risen today. Grave 
Unto the grave, what will we see? Christ, he lives. Amen. Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Oh, sing some praise this morning. You may be seated. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name. Lord, on this glorious Easter morning, we are humbled and amazed at the depth of your love and the extent of your grace in that you gave us the greatest gift ever given, your only son, Jesus. He was the only hope we had. And when the time was right, as you had promised, he came, lived a perfect and sinless life that was acceptable to you, died a substitutionary death on the cruel cross, for sinners like all of us. He paid all of our debts so that we wouldn't have to. He was buried and Lord on the third day in victory. You raised him from the dead and I thank you that on this Easter morning, we serve and worship a risen Lord. Lord, I thank you for this service today and ask your blessings on it. And I ask blessings on every component of it, on the musicians and the choir, because how can we have Easter and not celebrate with worship and music? I pray for our pastor today, as he has the privilege of proclaiming the best news ever told. Lord, if there's one this morning here that doesn't know Jesus, that doesn't have a personal relationship with them. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will grip them and make that introduction to him today. Lord, for those of us who are believers in and followers of Christ now, my prayer is that every day we would live our lives in such a way that it reflects him so that when a lost and dying world looks at us, they will want what we've got. Finally, Lord, I want to say thank you again for that greatest gift. Thank you for the man of sorrows, the suffering servant, the slaughtered lamb, the roaring lion of Judah, the victor over death and hell, the king of kings, our Lord, our risen Savior, your Son, Jesus. Hallelujah and amen.
conquered the grave. He's the Lord of life. He's the Lord of peace. And he's the Lord of love. And he is the Lord of all. Would you crown him with your worship this morning as we continue to praise him? Stand with me and let's worship. Now we 
the Lord of all. You've conquered death, hail, and the grave, and you live forevermore, living to transform us. God, thank you for your work in and among us this morning as we have sung your praise, and as Ben comes to preach the word, Lord, we pray that you'll continue that transforming work in our lives, that you will change us by your grace and by your mighty power. We love you, Lord. We're grateful for this time together. We pray that you will use it for your honor and your glory as we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You be seated. Turn to Isaiah 53 as we conclude our series uh, looking at the suffering servant. It was June 15th, 1850. And atop the Winchester Cathedral, dread set in. See, the uh, English army had met Napoleon at Waterloo. And they had devised a system to quickly get information back to England. And so from the ships in the English Channel, there awaited on top of the Winchester Cathedral word of the news. General Wellington had fought the battle. And then the news came, and the first two words were this, Wellington defeated. And right at that time, a fog blew in. And the message was obscured. And as the message then continued to reverberate around England, Wellington defeated. England had lost. Hope was lost. Life forever changed. It was not until a couple hours later when the fog lifted that the rest of the message could be proclaimed. The words that had been obscured were this, Wellington defeated the enemy. And everything changed and hope was there. When we look at the suffering servant, 700 years before Jesus, this picture of Jesus coming, this prophecy of Jesus coming, uh, the first stanza declares it's through humiliation that his wisdom will see triumph. But the next three stanzas, let's, let's face it, are pretty depressing. There's a lot of defeat in those that he would be wounded for our transgression and crushed for our iniquity, that he would be laid in a, in a grave of commoners uh, with, with criminals and a, and a rich man. And therefore, we, we leave these next three stanzas uh, feeling the weight of the, the words Christ defeated. But that is not the end. There is a stanza that awaits in stanza five we see and we hear. Would you read it with me? Yet it was the will, verse 10, sorry, yet... It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore... I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. We see this 
this fifth stanza, first of all, we recognize that the servant is exalted, that what was declared in the first stanza is true. It was wisdom that brought Jesus to humiliation, Jesus on the cross, and that through that humiliation, in the resurrection of Jesus, he would be exalted to the point of King of kings and Lord of lords. Every knee will bow before him. But notice in verse 10 what it says, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. We had seen in the previous stanza that it was oppression and injustice that had taken place against Jesus. But lest we be confused, those were not the main driving reasons. Yes, those took place against him, but it was God's will that he would be crushed. In John 10, 18, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. He was slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8 says. The Trinity was pleased that this would happen. This was the plan that a a lamb, a sacrificial lamb would be laid for us and our sin. I I used to watch uh, as a kid uh, movies about uh, the crucifixion and and the trial of Jesus or, or read through the accounts. When I would read through the accounts, I would go, oh, it was so close. He almost made it out. If he would just have, have, if Pilate would have just had the guts, then he could have been free and, and, and let loose. Friends, don't be deceived. It was God's will to crush him. It was God's will that Jesus go to the cross. And it says, when the soul was made an offering for guilt, an offering, a sacrificial offering for the guilt of our sins, the servant will be vindicated says he will see his seed. He will see a seed, his, his offspring. Uh, we saw last week that he was condemned to childlessness. He, he did not have an offspring or a child. And yet through the resurrection, he uh, buys, gets, carries with him children of God that his seed is forever set. It's a spiritual seed. As 1 John 3, 1 will say, we are the children of God. His sacrifice has been vindicated, not cut off from the world, but now alive and a a people, a a group of children who call him Lord. Not only that, but he says he shall prolong his days. How does one who has died prolong his days? only through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, three through four, it says this, uh, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. We talked about this last week, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. But that's not the end of this, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. What scriptures is Paul talking about here? Uh, Oftentimes you'll hear, well, resurrection really isn't talked about in the Old Testament. Friends, Paul believed it was talked about in the Old Testament. And right here that he will prolong his days is a testament, a prophecy of Jesus's fulfilling the resurrection and living. Jesus's days have been prolonged. Jesus is still alive and will be alive forevermore. The will of of the Lord then, it says, will prosper in his hands. This wisdom in the first stanza now becomes evident to all of us. Why would Jesus subject himself to this? So that he might redeem a people unto himself, that he might prosper, that the the name of Jesus might not, that it may prosper to everyone who would believe. The question often comes up, you've probably dealt with it, does God cause bad things to happen to good people. And has been said, and as one scholar said so well, my friends, there has only been one good person who has ever lived on the earth. And yes, God caused bad things to take place to him, to redeem to himself a people, a people lost in their sins who now have fellowship and unity with him. Not only is the servant exalted But praise God, the debt is paid. Look at verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. 
one of the beautiful realities and truths of the resurrection is the recognition that the debt is paid. It is finished. If Jesus had not accomplished the work, then resurrection would not have taken place. Notice here in this verse that is out of the anguish of his soul. It's not only a physical suffering. We, as we've seen on movies, can, can only observe physical suffering of Jesus, and it was horrific. But friends, the, the, the soul, the holistic suffering of Jesus as he walked to the cross, the burden that he bore, the sins of the world, how could we place that into a category? How could we even hope to feel what that felt like? I think this definition, the anguish of his soul is good. The sacrifice, the Lamb of God accepted before the Father. Complete rejection. He was despised and rejected by men, led to complete satisfaction. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. My friends, one of the beautiful things about the resurrection is this. God is satisfied with the punishment for sin. And it is not no longer on you to be punished. If you would but receive the free gift of salvation, but the satisfaction of God is in Christ Jesus. So we can come to him, not in condemnation, not in fear, but in reality that all of of the condemnation has been poured out and now we have a satisfied father who longs, who, who it was his will to do this so he would gather a people together who could stand and declare all hail the power of Jesus' name. What joy we have to live in the power of the resurrection. But notice that it's through his sacrifice, through his offering, that he will make many to be accounted righteous. I love that term, uh, accounted, that, that we would see and understand. If you look at the checkbook of my life, uh, what I deserve, you see debt after debt after debt, ways I've failed God, ways that I've come short of his glory, and all I have to offer is nothing. But standing there, Jesus in my place says, I'll pay your debt. And friends, I look at the debt book of my life now, and it's stamped paid in full. No more. The full debt has been paid. We have been accounted righteous. Not by our own actions, not by the fact that we try to do good things or to serve him, but because of what Jesus has done on the cross and in his resurrection, we are assured that the debt is paid in full. The debt is paid and it is finished. The servant is exalted. The debt is paid. And then last, the servant wins. The servant that's despised and rejected of men, he wins. Look at verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Friends, to the victor go the spoils. And Jesus receives the spoils. You thought he was a nobody. You thought he was, he was nothing special. He, he came from, from nowhere and he, he died a sinner commoner death. You thought that he was no more, but he wins. And in winning, he gets everything. He gets everything that comes with winning. And in a great plot twist, he turns around and divides the spoils with us. Woo! He shall divide the spoil with the, the strong or with the numerous, with the many that he's been talking about here. Strong or numerous, those who have received his gift of salvation to any who would simply believe. To believe in faith is to say, I believe it is true. I receive that gift that you've offered. To say, I will try to do it on my own and come up with my own ways is to reject his gift. 
And friends, there is no freedom from suffering or condemnation at that point. You get what you deserve, but oh, the free gift of God through Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection that is offered to us if we will but receive that gift. The gift that's been divided, the spoils with the numerous and strong. Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect and a sinless life. He lived the life we have not. And then stood in our place to allow the wrath of God, the punishment of God to be fully satisfied. And then he offers us the spoil of that victory, his own righteousness in our stead, clothed in his righteousness alone before the Father. We now can have eternal life, eternal uh, presence, relationship with God. What a gift. Today, you may be here simply celebrating a holiday can I encourage you to receive the gift of salvation for yourself, claim it as your own and walk out of here alive to Christ, having a a part of the spoils that he has won, the spoils of eternal life. And then he makes intercession. Why why did he win? Uh, the, The verse tells us, number one, he laid bare his soul to death. In other words, he walked faithfully all the way through the task, never turning aside, never holding the white flag and saying, sorry, these people aren't worth it, I'm out of here. He was faithful even to death on the cross. And then he was numbered with the transgressors. He didn't open his mouth to defend himself. He took our place where we stood in the transgression of our sin. He walked in our place. He stood with the transgressors. And then he bore away the sin of many. He is the lamb of God. He is the one who our transgressions were placed on his head. He sacrificed for us and took away the punishment of our sin. And then notice the result at the end of verse 12 and makes intercession for the transgressors. To to intercede for someone is to stand in their place. It's the idea in the middle. It's kind of with baseball season starting, uh, when, a, when a player and an umpire start to go out, many times the coach will jump in between and he'll take, he'll take the argument from here. Let me stand in your place. And the idea here is that Jesus, in, in our need, in our, in our rightful justice that was coming to us, death and separation from God because of our sin, Jesus steps in between and says, I'll take it for you. He makes intercession for us. In fact, he still makes intercession for us. Romans 8 says, he's still pleading with the Father on your behalf if you have placed your faith and trust in him. What a promise made 700 years before Christ. The servant exalted, the debt is paid and the servant wins. I would like for us to consider for a few minutes the implications of this verse, the resurrection, the reality of now a whole relationship with Christ. First is this, consider for a moment the worth of your life. In our day and age, in our society, there are discussions, what is a life really worth? And friends, it is in the the death and resurrection of Jesus that we see the depths with which he considers our life. Why would someone walk through this? Simply just to to get a name for themselves? No, to redeem a people who had rebelled against God. Friends, your life is worth the sacrifice of Jesus. Would you come to him today? It is worth living because of what Jesus has done. Never begin to think or consider my life is not worth anything. Look to Jesus and recognize the worth of your life. Secondly, I'd like for us to think about the need of a savior. The depths with which our sin had taken us. The depths with which it took that full atonement of our sins, the covering of our sins, the forgiveness of our sins. If there were any easier way, surely we would have done that. But the only way to redeem a people unto himself was to submit himself to the wrath of God, the punishment for our sins on the cross, and he did. 
If there's ever a doubt, if pride begins to seep in our heart and mind, hey, you know what? Maybe, maybe I'm not so bad. Maybe, maybe God needs me in this. Let us look again to the cross and the resurrection to be reminded of our desperate need of a savior. It is indeed hopeless without him. And friends, I would remind you of a third thing, the surety of eternity. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are assured, we are confident that we too will live for eternity in his presence. 1 Corinthians 15, one of the the great passages on the resurrection, Paul will declare, look, if the resurrection didn't happen, then friends, we, we're one blaspheming against God by saying Jesus rose from the dead and then we're wasting our time. There are so many other things you could do this morning besides being here if Jesus wasn't resurrected. But if he was, then it changes everything. Our eternity is secure. Those who place their faith and trust in him, even walking through difficulty and struggle we can rest assured of eternal life with him. What the fog had obscured on that Friday and Saturday, on Sunday, the rest of the message was declared. The fog had obscured and people saw his death and recognized Christ defeated. Where is the hope in death? Where is the hope in the one so maliciously treated, now dead in the grave. But on Sunday morning, the rest of the message was heard loud and clear. Christ defeated death. And now we even have a fuller message. The the message to us even grows. Christ defeated death and he offers and gives us his life. And we live today not in our life, but in his. How do we live this life now in light of the resurrection? One, we can serve Christ without fear. Even when the fog in our lives covers over our circumstances, we can serve God and serve Christ with abandon because he has redeemed to us himself and therefore we can live in obedience to him whatever the cost, whatever we're asked to do. We can declare this message to to people around us, to our neighbors, to our city, to our world. I was reminded today or this week of the sobering fact that there are over 4 billion people in this world who do not know the resurrection story. Today they wake up and it is a day just like any other without hope, living life they've never heard. And because he has risen, we have the responsibility to declare and to hold fast and true the message of Jesus here and around the world. The rest of the message is important. Christ defeated death and we must share it and declare it. The other thing that I think it compels us to do is this. In times of trials and troubles, we can have unwavering hope. And we can have solid joy because of the resurrection. Not because our circumstances are all in grand and all in place. To trust Christ doesn't mean that our world changes in, in, in our circumstances immediately. We will still face trials and trouble. But in those things, we hold out to incredible hope. Because even if my life seems like a waste, The truth of the resurrection is my life is not. Christ has redeemed me and he has promised to hold me fast until that day I see him in a resurrected body in a new way. I think as we look today to Christians around us, we recognize some have lost the message in the fog. Some have been overwhelmed by fog circumstances in their life. Maybe today and this year, as you look back on your celebration of the resurrection, we don't just celebrate it today. We celebrate it every day. The implications of the resurrection are for us tomorrow and next week as we walk together on this journey. But maybe today the fog of a busy schedule 
has caused you to be obscured in the reality that Christ has defeated death. And the busyness of life has bogged you down to a place of, of hopelessness or struggling. Can I offer you today the joy of the resurrection? That even in a busy life, he has defeated death. Maybe this year you've been bogged down with bad news. Maybe it seems to just be overwhelming news after news after news. Maybe today, this, week, this year you've suffered from sickness. You've received a diagnosis in your own life or in someone close to you that is a wave of fog that seems to obscure what hope do we have in life. Today, I just want to remind you what the fog may obscure does not change the fact that Jesus has defeated death and we can walk through every circumstance because he has. Maybe you're suffering today from the fog of a broken heart. Maybe you come in here and you say, Ben, I have been pursuing things that really don't matter in light of eternity. And I'm stuck in the fog of wrong priorities. The joy of the gospel is you come, you can repent and believe and, and walk with him in the joy of resurrection today. Come and, and secure those priorities for him. He has secured eternal life for you. Receive the gift and serve him. In 1969, Bill and Gloria Gaither wrote the hymn, uh, because he lives. And it's become a, a staple in, in churches since that time. Glory was asked one time why, what, what inspired that, that song. And she said she was pregnant with her, her third child. And in 1969, it was a difficult year. There, were, there, were, there was great upheaval with the Vietnam War. There were uh, protests going on and she became overwhelmed in the fog. She became depressed and looking at outward circumstances saying, how could I bring a child into this world in this day and age? And she said one day she began becoming overwhelmed as a friend helped and prayed with them. At the reality of the resurrection, I want you to hear her words. It says this, it dawned on us that the resurrection is a true thing. It's true in every situation. It's true in the world to come. God's got a plan. Resurrection is a fact of life. And I think it was built into the earth as a metaphor for Christ in the very beginning of creation. It's the principle that life wins. If we put our trust in him, we are victors. She says, what if the world blows up tomorrow? Our destiny and our life and our future do not depend on circumstances. What if the world blows up tomorrow? What if this wor world in this, this day of upheaval with Russia and Ukraine and Israel and Hamas, with an election year, friends, no matter what is being celebrated today, on this day, we stand and declare Jesus is Lord, no matter the circumstance. Even if the world would blow up, it would not defeat or we would not be deterred in one bit. Christ has defeated death. And he gives us his life. And she said it well, life is worth the living. Amen. Live life to the fullness because of what Christ has done for us. Just because he lives, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy of the resurrection. Father, I thank you that from the beginning of time, your plan was to redeem to you, your people. I thank you that today my hope lies not in circumstances in the world, but in the resurrection of Jesus. And I pray if anyone here is in a fog, missing the full message, they've lost sight in their circumstances of the victory that is in Christ Jesus, that today you would overwhelm them with the clarity of the message that Christ has defeated death and he offers us his life. And may we leave here today not overwhelmed by circumstances or fog, but overwhelmed by the clarity and the beauty of the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we respond to the Lord, I'll be here in the front. If you'd love, I'd love to talk with you further about what it means 
to trust Jesus as your Savior. Or maybe there's a next step of obedience that you know you need to take because he lives. Because he lives, we can obey him with abandon. You, just, you respond. Would you stand? Let's sing together. This morning, Johnny's going to come and introduce a new member. I have waited a long time to introduce to you this new member. I've come to love her very deeply. Most of you know who she is, and it's an honor to present to you our newest member of Travis Avenue, Bobby Brazil. Bobby, come join us up here in the front. Karen, thank you for walking her. Roger, you too. Bobby's a former missionary for the IMB, and she has served. 20 years in 22 different countries. I know of no one who's done that before. I just love you, Bobby, so much so. And she's so fun to know and talk to. I want to encourage you. Please, please come meet her on your way out. Let me say one thing about today and about her. She was baptized on April 22nd, 1984, Easter Sunday morning. And she was desiring greatly to be introduced as our newest member on Easter Sunday. So that's why I've had to wait for so long to get her up here. I'm so glad. And so I can assure you, I can assure you and assure you, she has asked Christ into her life. She has been baptized April 22nd, 1984. And she loves the Lord deeply and is involved in our church greatly. She is. So if you agree with having her as our newest member of Travis Avenue, would you please signify by saying amen. amen. Come by and meet her later on. Bill, it's all yours. Amen. Church family, would you stand as we sing the doxology?
thank you for celebrating our risen Lord with us today. And let me just say, he is worthy of our praise each and every day. So go celebrate him today. Travis, you are sent. <laughs>